I have no um, uh, um, uh, disclaimers, but our fellowship programs do uh, receive some uh, educational funding uh, from uh, pharmaceutical companies. The objectives of my presentation for the next few minutes uh, are directed both to residents and fellows as well as attendings. And for the residents and fellows, I think I want you to, at the end of all this, be able to understand the different pathways to becoming an hepatobiliary surgery, the surgeon, the strengths and potential limitations of them, and the considerations uh, before choosing your fellowship. I want you to recognize the balance that you ought to have between expectations and opportunities upon the completion of your fellowship. Learn how to play the match game, because it's a real game out there. And most importantly, to become a knowledgeable and empowered seeker of a fellowship in hepatobiliary surgery. For the attending staff in the, in, in the room, uh, I hope that this will help you advise and mentor your residents who are interested in uh, training in hepatobiliary surgery, understand what's required of a fellowship program, understand that there's real competition for the Blue Ribbon uh, residents who are graduating, and finally, this may be able to help you interpret the pedigree of individuals you are considering for new uh, to bring on a new junior staff uh, based on the um, uh, uh, the training they've had. My personal disclosure is that I'm a program director of a HPB fellowship. I'm also a program director of an abdominal organ transplant fellowship. I previously debated the uh, preference of, of, of cross-training and transplant versus surgical oncology, but like to think over the past few years, I've become a little more balanced in my thinking and hope I present a more balanced uh, uh, viewpoint um, uh, today. A brief vignette, because you want to find a quality fellowship program, a brief vignette is that my, uh, my um, uh, friend, who was um, um, uh, a year ahead of me, went off to do his fellowship in 1980, uh, Patability Fellowship with a really famous individual, and came back three months later, bombed right out, didn't work, was the first assistant to a really difficult situation. That's what fellowships were like in the past. There was no guarantee of quality. The residents have a guarantee of quality because residencies are insured by the ACGME or the Royal College in Canada. You're going to get a quality experience. But in fact, there is no oversight for, re for fellowships. Um, and so uh, apart from a few of them like uh, uh, pediatric and surgeon and colorectal. And so the fellowships in, in HPB surgery, the fellowship opportunities, will range uh, from those well-structured um, uh, um, fellowships that meet all the requirements of a, of, of a general surgery residency, including the, the um, uh, credibility that comes with, with accreditation and reaccreditation from, from the sponsoring society and standards and curricula. And I'm going to refer to these as bona fide fellowships. As compared with uh, finding an academic individual and hanging out with him or her for a year or two and, and doing a rather ad hoc or what I'll call a rogue fellowship. So the three way, three path, and I'm gonna, only going to talk about the bona fide ones now. There are three pathways to training in a powderbillary surgery. You can get there through transplantation, through surgical oncology, or through powderbillary surgical fellowships. In transplantation, these um, um, uh, through the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, there are 68 programs which offer over 80 positions. The world doesn't need 80 transplant surgeons each year, let alone North America. It's a two-year fellowship. It's credited by the STS, matched by the NRMP. Programs can be tra can be certified for uh, training in liver or pancreas or kidney and small intestine. And now there is a HB and HPB tracks. We do know that many graduates have practiced HB and HBP surgery, and um, they've adopted the, um, uh, for the HB and HPP tracks, they've adopted the same criteria as we have uh, in the Fellowship Council and the AHPBA. The surgical oncology uh, route towards uh, training in hepatobiliary surgery, there are 18 uh, um, uh, surgical fellowships offering about 45 positions in North America. It's a two-year fellowship accredited by the surgical oncologist and in Canada by the Royal College. Uh, was recently uh, achieved American Board and ACGME uh, 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 certification. Uh, these uh, fellows are matched by the um, uh, Society of Surgical Oncology, but this will probably switch over to the NRMP. They do have HPB track fellows. In some centers, it's the focus of a second year. In other centers, it's a third additional HPB year and uh, the society does not have any formal HPB requirements, either curriculum or case volumes. 
The AHPBA, in linkage with the Fellowship Council, there are now 20 programs that have been accredited, uh, offering one or two year fellowships. The uh, curriculum is standard for these fellowships, but clearly the case mixes differ. There are those that focus more on oncology, some offer transplant, some offer uh, complex upper GI, some are more dominant in, in MIS. Uh, there are re uh, mandatory uh, case volume requirements, and I will note that the uh, certificate um, is only given out to individuals who meet all of the criteria. In addition to those 20 programs, there's one transplant fellowship, uh, Dr. Chapman's, that has been dual accredited, and our, our uh, fellowship is currently being reviewed for dual accreditation. Uh, our match is within the fellowship council. So I want to talk about the differences between these three pathways, the strengths and potential limitations of each of them. And on the right, on, on the left hand side, for transplantation, what does transplantation offer? Well, I'm going to say some obvious things. Transplant teaches you to understand transplantation, end stage liver disease, and other surgical diseases of the liver. What does surgical oncology teaches you? It teaches you to understand cancer and the biology of cancer. And what does HPB surgery teach you? It teaches you to understand the diseases of the liver, the bile duct, and the pancreas. Subtle differences, but very real. And so in transplantation, you're exposed to the outside of the liver, extrapatic anatomy, and you get a lot of experience in vascular reconstruction. Surgical oncology, you will get variable expo exposure to hepatobiliary surgery, procedures, and technical skills. Whereas with the HPB surgical fellowships, there's a broad exposure to HPB diseases and operations, benign, malignant, MIS, and open. There's some limitations to each of these pathways. In transplantation, you won't get that in-depth exposure to the principles of surgical oncology. You will see much less benign and broad-based HPV diseases. You may not see much MIS at all. Surgical oncology, you may not see an awful lot of benign disease. You may not do a lot of portal vein resections and reimplantations or arterial reconstructions. And you may have very limited MIS HPV exposure, whereas within HPV, you may not get quite the details of surgical oncology, and you have much less exposure to vascular reconstructions. I'll comment as well that the surgical oncologists do uh, subscribe to the ACGME uh, um, uh, guidelines. So, so what do you get out of these different fellowships? Well, with transplantation, you'll get a certificate in transplantation. With surgical oncology, you'll get a certificate in surgical oncology, and with HPV surgery, you'll get a certificate in HPV surgery. So what? What do these certificates mean? Well, I would suggest that this is evolving. And um, I would like to speculate, well, uh, first of all, currently what happens, your program director signs off on your ability to, to do the operations when it comes to hospital credentialing. I would predict, however, that as, these, as our discipline grows and matures, that certification and subspecialty will become required uh, both by the hospital and by your, your um, uh, prospective um, employers, your, your attending staff. Whether this will lead to an examination system the way the Europeans have, we'll have to see. But it also helps the attendings evaluate an applicant's fellowship uh, uh, training and ask the question, does a certificate in abdominal organ transplantation or surgeon really uh, qualify you as an HPV surgeon and vice versa? So for the, for the uh, residents and fellows, I think you have to have the right balance between expectations and opportunities. The opportunities are straightforward. You can be a transplant surgeon, you can be an academic HPV surgeon, or you can be an HPV surgeon in a group of, 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 with, with, with a, a, a broad-based general surgery practice. How about job opportunities? Well, we all know that there's limited transplant uh, job opportunities, and that's clearly led to the limited number of blue ribbon candidates that apply to transplantation. There's about a dozen each year that apply for those 80 jobs. For HPB surgeons, what's the likelihood that you're going to be a pure HPB surgeon and land a job in which 75% of the stuff you do the first day is going to be HPB surgery? Well, there's three or four each year. And so I would think that the vast majority of individuals aspiring to be an HPB surgeon will bring those HPB skills to a group of general surgeons and grow their practice from a 10 or 20% to over 50% as you have seen your mentors do. And so I think you need to consider what else you are going to do in addition to HPB surgery. Well, with the transplanters, they're going to do transplantation, but they can also do kidneys and pancreases. They can do vascular access. They can do HPB surgery. And they do live donor hepatectomies. The surgical oncologists can do non-operative HPB surgical oncology, manage all the hepatomas and taste them and RF them and all. 
uh, the other GI oncology, benign disease. You could do benign disease. And within hepatobiliary surgery, HPB, you want to be an HPB surgeon. Um, in addition to that, you could do co additional complex uh, surgery, um, uh, uh, benign, malignant, usually gastrointestinal tract. So you have to consider what you want to do in addition to your HPB surgery. And so as a transplanter, if you want to be a, a good transplant surgeon, you want to seek a transplant program that either has HP and HPB accreditation by the ASTS or dual accredited with a fellowship council. If you want to go through the surgical oncology route to be an HPV surgeon, you want to find a surgical oncology program that has that additional HPV exposure, and there's a few of them, or an HPV program that's heavy on oncology. And within HPV surgeries, I think there's a little more breadth. If you want to be a HPV surgeon doing a complex MIS HPV, well, there's a, 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 a number of programs that will offer that to you. On the other hand, if you want to be an HPV surgeon who's doing complex vascular reconstructions and uh, crazy operations, then you're going to seek out an HPV program that has a strong transplant component or a transplant program that offers HPV. Quick comment on the match game. This year, uh, 2013, matching for the spots uh, next year, starting next July, uh, the transplant um, uh, applications are open. They opened in January, and they will uh, rank... Um, They'll be interviewing soon, and they'll rank uh, date is in June. Surgical oncology, they haven't announced their dates yet, but they're probably going to be similar to last year in that they will open in July, and their rank day will be in September. And the, and, the, and the HPB surgeons through the Fellowship Council, their match will be simultaneous with the surgical oncology match. And so you as a resident in your PGA-5 year can only apply through one of these two matches. They are, they, you cannot uh, participate in both matches at the same time. Next year, on the other hand, HPV surgery is moving up to the same time as transplant, and so you're going to have to apply in your PGY four year, and you can either apply to transplant or HPV surgery, and once that's done, you'd be able to apply to Surgeonc if, uh, if you didn't match. And so in summary, Mr. Chairman, we fully recognize that transplantation, surgical oncology, and HPV fellowships offer different opportunities. They each have different uh, merits, different li limitations, and they lead to subtle but very real differences in career paths. I think it's very important for the c individual considering a career in HPV surgery to have realistic expectations and aspirations, and here a lot of personal insight I think will be very valuable. Are you really going to be an academic surgeon? Are you really going to? Is that in your blood, or is it just something you think you might want to do? Secondly, I think you have to be very honest with yourself with regards to your technical skills. Not everybody can take the portal vein out and sew it back together. And there's a lot more to life than sewing the portal vein back together. So I think you have to be very honest with yourself in what you, st <laughs> in what you, what, what you uh, want to do. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and consider your uh, additional uh, non-HPB activities. Uh, finally, a brief comment. Uh, we all want to train outliers. You want to become an outlier. You want to become an outstanding hepatobiliary surgeon. And Malcolm Gladwell has given us some insight into what he thinks uh, 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 leads to you becoming an outlier. He, by the way, was a Canadian. Um, you got you got to be smart enough. IQ 120 will get you there. Got you into med school. It got you through surgery. 140 is too smart. It's crazy. Um, you have to do that 10,000 hours of practice. Well, we're all doing that. We're nose to the grindstone. But most importantly, that every outlier owes something to parentage and patronage. They are invariably the beneficiaries of hidden advantages and extraordinary opportunities that allow them to succeed where others cannot. And that's your fellowship. So I'll close with this picture of the recent reunion we had for our mentor, Bernie Langer, of uh, 50 of our former fellows come back to Toronto. And I uh, encourage you to come to uh, the uh, Langer Symposium this afternoon, or this evening. Thanks very much.